Welcome to all the AIG members who have made it here tonight, uh, who are both here in person at the Transcontinental Hotel and those who are at home joining us. A um, little bit different to our normal technical meetings. Um, I won't say much about what's happening in Queensland tonight because this is really about the uh, federal branch um, and uh, how it affects all of us here. So uh, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce Chris, Chris Dickinson, our chair. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. I assume the world online can hear me okay. I guess just before we get started, I just want to check um, Lynn or Mark, have we got confirmation that we have a quorum here? We have got a quorum. Okay, great. Um, what I'd like to do is just get through the AGM as the first point of order. So we've got eight items that I need to step through. Um, I'm hoping this won't take up too much time. The president's report's probably the longest of them. Um, and then after the AGM, we have two presentations, one's from our CEO, Jamie. Oh, there's Jamie in the back there. And another is on the Jaw Code Review Update, which has been done by Rod and Anne afterwards. Um, so my eyesight's not that good. I just need to get a little bit closer. Um, the first is, is our traditional welcome for our board meetings, which um, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists acknowledges the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of the nation and the traditional custodians of the lands where we live, learn and work. We pay our respects to ancestors and elders past and present. We're committed to a positive future for Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, I also recognise we have a number of existing directors in the room. We've got Rod, obviously. Mark Derriman is up from Sydney. Um, we have our CEO here in Jamie. Have I missed anybody in the room? And I'm assuming we've probably got some directors online as well. Thanks very much for attending. Uh, the first point of order is uh, apologies. Do we have any confirmed apologies? I have two apologies that uh, need to go on the record. Um, the first is Andrew Waltho, who is in Morocco. And the second is Doug Brown, who is in Pakistan at the moment. Um, any other apologies, either online or from the room? No. Okay. And uh, Lynn is also present, executive officer. All right. Uh, do we have any proxies, uh, Lynn or Mark? Are you aware of any proxies tonight? Okay. Well, the first, the second item is the acceptance of the 2022 AGM minutes. Um, these were posted on the members portal for people who wanted to refresh their memories. The motion is that the minutes of the 2022 AGM held on the 11th of May, 2022, online and at the Orange X Services Club in Orange, New South Wales, as tabled, be confirmed. If there's, I'm not aware of any questions about the minutes. Um, we have a proposer and a seconder. Mark, proposer. Rod, second. Vote in the affirmative. It looks like that's been voted in. Um, are we doing votes online? It's, a, it's only by exception. We don't need to have a vote here. It would be by exception. So sorry. Okay. Okay, great. So the president's report. Um, that's me. I guess we've had a very busy year. This has been quite an eye-opening experience for me and I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's, um, I've been on the board for three years now and it's been very eye-opening to me as to how much volunteer effort actually goes into the work that the AIG achieves. And that's not just the, the, the federal board, that is the branches, it is all the subcommittees, it's all the volunteers who support the initiatives that the AIG runs. The deeper I get into the AIG, the more amazing I think the people are that are actually running it. Um, the main, I guess, topics of discussion is really that our governance updates process has been running for a few years now. We are nearing the end of it. Um, it's been a heck of a process. A lot of work's gone into it, but I think the outcome's been really positive. As we sort of finish the governance update work, we'll be transitioning back into the operational improvement in the strategic direction. And there, there are elements of the, that the board has, has been looking at, but we've certainly been focused also on the governance work. We've got a lot of highlights to celebrate, but we also have a lot of 
challenges to face as well. And I'll, I'll touch on those with some slides. And I've already mentioned the, um, the amazing volunteerism that the Institute has. So highlights, um, and I've got a couple more to add to this. COVID seems a distance memory. Uh, there is definitely an enthousi enthusiasm to return to in-person meetings and a renewed interest in events. Um, I think we've almost forgotten that COVID was a thing. Certainly, uh, it's, it's very positive to see that engagement occurring. Events themselves have been really good as well. And I've got a slide just touching on those. The expansion of the awards program. So last year, we introduced a new award, which was aimed at the branch level of distinguished service. And that was received really warmly. Um, the appointment of our CEO, um, I think, has been a real highlight of the year. Um, Jamie joined us in February and has already had a very significant and positive impact on the, on the operations. Uh, we continue to update and release instruments of governance. And as I said, we transition to operations and strategies. I think the Institute and the members have a really good awareness of some of the global issues that geoscience is facing. And this is not necessarily just about the AIG. We're talking about issues such as education, um, the challenges with, with maintaining university content, the challenges with achieving the mineral inventory that's expected of the green transition. Um, there's lots there. there. Now, there's two other items I, I didn't get on the slide that I do want to mention. One is our education committee and the bursary program. I think they're really worth noting, particularly the bursary programs into its 22nd year. And that's, that's helped out 230 or so students. And I think we had 24 applications from eight universities for the bursary program this year. So that's, that's great. And the work that the education committee um, does is highly relevant. And they also uh, presented a workshop at AEGC this year and they drew industry in, they drew academia in. It was a really, really good process. Um, the other group I wanted to mention that's not on the slide, it'll be in my report is, is um, the NGG group. I think the, the work, I, I had the pleasure of attending meetings that the NGG group ran and the work of our supporting our early career geoscientists and the positivity of that group, I think it's amazing. And the sooner we can get those sorts of emerging leaders into roles on the board or roles on the branches, the better for the Institute. Um, so there's just a snapshot of, of a few of the events that we've had throughout the year. Um, we've had AEGC 23, which included the Wall Hinman Symposium, the Structural Geology and Resources Symposium in Kalgoorlie, which was hugely successful. Um, Smedge Golden Jubilee, and later this month, we've got the Victoria Minerals Roundup in uh, Ballarat, I believe. Also had the Rare Earths Elements uh, Symposium, Project Geologist Toolkit, Core Skills, Jork Discussion Forums, and the Competent Persons Workshops. And the AIG also supported the Dorothy Hill Symposium in Brisbane earlier in the year. Um, lots of branch technical content across the Institute, and lots of social and networking events too, which include um, obviously the Christmas parties, but student and industry nights, and I've attended some of those and they've been amazingly positive. And especially those events that are collaborating with kindred bodies is really, really good for the industry. Um, I like that we have GeoHugs, GeoPubs and Brisbane Brews. I think that's a real, a real positive way of approaching social interaction with the, with the Institute. We also got our challenges and there's a few of them. Um, effective communication has, has been a, a real challenge. We had a really good face-to-face -face meeting. It was the first one in three years of the board in uh, Perth at the end of last year, and communications consumed a great deal of time. And, and we've got, there's been a lot of work go into trying to push the way that we change our communications and modernise our communications, um, but the rubber hasn't yet hit the road. And I think that's going to be a key element of the work that the new board is going to be pushing forward. Um, communications is also sits in three of our four quadrants of strategy. So it's, it's really important. Geoscience education, and that's a national challenge. And it's one that I've been involved with a number of discussions inside and outside of the AIG. Um, I've spoken with a lot of university representatives about the content of degrees and the, the challenge of uh, attracting new graduates to their programs. Um, I'm not going to go into depth on that, but I think it also ties in with this last item here. I have a image and profile, and that's not 
a, an, an issue associated with the AIG, that's really a challenge for geoscientists. We, we have to try to de-link the opinion that geoscience equals bad. And I think that getting an education process out that engages with the younger generation, but also does a better job at communicating with the general public will help a lot in, in improving that. You know, if we're going to embark upon this, this is just one of many a gazillion images you can get off the internet. Um, I just grabbed this one quickly this morning. Um, the minerals inventory targets that are being set to achieve the green transition are incredibly aggressive. Um, this one here, all this this highlights is that the average time for all commodities worldwide to take a discovery to the start of construction design is over twelve years. So when you roll that out on a scale of, of, of mineral assets that need to be developed and you superimpose on that the lack of geoscientists coming through, it's simply an impossible task. So being able to attract students, getting an education for them that's in, that is correct for them is the only way I think we've got a chance of meeting this sort of thing. Industry retention continues to be a challenge. Dale did a really good presentation at, the la at last year's AGM. Um, where he introduced uh, the issues with retention of women in industry and how at, uh, in the age bracket of less than 25, it's basically gender balanced. Um, but as soon as you get older than that, the, the women just fall away from the workforce. I think there's another issue there too, and that is that young families, you know, uh, geoscientists might embark on a career with a FIFO role, but it might not suit them when they start having kids and start settling down. Rather than lose them from industry, is there an opportunity to cross skill and have them do a career pivot into something else? Um, advocacy and lobbying. Um, Mark had a real Mark Berry had a really good chat with me when I first became president about the importance of lobbying. And I've got some ideas, I've got some slides I'm going to present about the RPGO program and how I think that can be used to to help push this along. But it's it's almost a lost art. We don't seem to have that that voice that we used to have. And I know that the AGC is perhaps the correct mechanism to do that, but I don't think the AIG should be silent. I think we should use the tools that we have and the people that are passionate about this and perhaps move forward with, with our own advocacy and lobbying approach. And as I said, I'll talk about that shortly. Governance. Um, this has been obviously a big focus for the last few years. On the right-hand side, of this is a simple graphic, which is basically copied from the work that Dale presented last year. And it's, I like it because it's a simple and robust description of what the AIG is. The membership are the owners of the AIG. The board manages the governance, but the operations is where everything happens. And being able to support all this to the satisfaction of the ownership and having a board which is proactive is really important. In terms of the governance achievements, um, this time last year, we got the new constitution in place. This year, we have the new code of ethics, which has been legally reviewed, and that's a special resolution that we'll touch on later in the presentation. We've also developed a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Um, I'd hope that we get that out today. I held that process up. I was just too busy, but it'll be released imminently. Um, this is a really important piece of modern governance that we have to have within the AIG. The, the board have invested a huge amount of time in this. We've got a lot of legal advice on it as well. And we've aimed at keeping it as practical and pragmatic as we possibly can. The, the policy is brief. It links to our code of ethics and it provides an avenue for complaints management through our complaints process if, if it's needed. Um, the board also includes a subcommittee to manage the rollout of the, the DE and I policy. Um, and it's not just the policy itself. The membership needs, needs uh, member supports that will actually go with that to help make the policy part of the fabric of the AIG. Um, that with the communications, I think, will be two of the main focuses of the new board as they, they roll out in the next year. The other thing that's been pretty important is procedures, processes and documentation. With, with an updated governance, um, with a new, I guess, a new structure to our board with reduced numbers and with the inclusion of a CEO, now we're, we're taking a, a fresh approach and we're building these procedures, processes and documentation. And the key to these is really, again, similar to the DE&I policy, 
they they need to be pragmatic. They need to be effective. They can't be long winded. Planning and strategy um, is still happening in the background. It just hasn't been the the heavy focus that it, it needs. That that should change in the next year. Um, we, as I said, we had a really positive two day workshop in November, which was hosted by the uh, the WA branch in Perth, and we achieved a lot. We spent two days invested in discussions with the entire board. And out of that, there were 11 focus resolutions that have pretty much all been acted on and another 40 action items that the board's working through. And these are focused on topics of operational systems and processes, communications again, update to the code of ethics and the DEI development, awards and recognition and the importance of that to, to maintaining a, a high level of respect and response, I think, to our volunteers. Membership processing, there'd been some challenges with getting membership processing in time, um, education and the appointment of our CEO. Uh, just touch on our strategy. So this was developed uh, around two years ago now, I think. It was in the preceding face-to-face, -face, which wasn't a face-to-face, -face, it was an online version. And we used a, um, a balanced scorecard approach to develop a four-quadrant strategy. Um, this is all online, but I'll just refresh what, what these are about. So we, we broke our quadrants into business, membership, technical and quality. We had a primary goal described for each, but there's a whole lot of subtasks that they all address. Uh, for business, the intent there is to develop and implement documented processes and controls to manage the business of the AIG. So that's fundamentally our, our documents, our controls, our processes, and our communications, but it's also our financial performance as well. And, and that's as important as anything else that we're looking at. Our second was our membership and our goal on our membership is to develop and implement a focused marketing and communications message to connect with the message, with the membership. Um, and this touches, this, this is another one which includes communication as a core goal and um, increasing our member numbers, speaking, uh, communicating with and engaging with our membership branch to board communications, membership to branch to board communications are all important. Third quadrant is technical and the goal there is to establish and deploy micro credentialing opportunities to play a lead role in conference and publication delivery. I'm not sure the micro credentialing term needs to be in there because I think we have lots on offer that we actually already develop. We have training, we have e-courses, seminars, webinars. We're already playing a leading role in conference delivery and we've already uh, involved in publications delivery. I think um, greater branch engagements in this area and um, working on that AIG brand recognition and growth to do with that external view of what geoscientists actually do is pretty important there. And this is the third of the four quadrants, which also includes communications. So that communication issues is flowing right throughout everything. The fourth quadrant is quality and to set and verify best practice, competency standards and professional ethics in the geoscience community. So this is where Jork sits, this is where Velmin sits, this is where the code of ethics sits, and this is where professionalism sits. And through the work that I, through a presentation that I did for the AGC, which I'll talk about shortly, I think it's really important to recognize that the AIG is a professional society and we're here for professionals. And there's a neat description as to what that means. Um, a lot of other societies are maybe learned societies. They have a less stringent expectation of their memberships but it doesn't mean they're less relevant to the, to the career aspirations of geoscientists. Um, the appointment of our CEO is a real highlight. So the first half of our, of our operating year since May last year, we spent on finding a suitable ca candidate and developing a, a role description and tasks that the CEO could undertake. We didn't want the CEO to be a surrogate for the board. It's important that the CEO had a role to perform for the business, but it was not to, to fulfill the duties of the directors. The directors still have to do their job. This is not to replace their job. Um, we initially focused, so so Jamie, obviously Jamie is our successful candidate and lot, lots of people will know Jamie from the JORC review process. Jamie's also a member of the AIG. So comes to the organization with intimate knowledge already. Um, Jamie's description of, of the CEO role is really neat. I like this. The overall purpose of the CEO role 
is to provide strategic hands-on leadership in revitalizing and reconnecting our national community to drive membership growth and maintain continued relevance to modern geoscience careers. And I think that essentially leaves the board doing what the board has traditionally done, but there's a bit of overlap to help the board, but really the CEO role is about the entire institute and all of the members. Couple of notes on members. So this is a, a, a summary table of our membership on the 1st of May of this year. A um, couple of things I'll point out is we have a current financial membership of just on 3,100. Um, we have an, uh, an RPGO count of over 200. We've got about 180 fellows and 2,500 and members. WA has the majority of our members, but our second largest cohort of membership is from overseas members membership. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, I went back and in our board meeting of April 22, our uh, financial members was 2,878. So there's probably a month difference between these numbers, but that's indicating about a five to 8% membership growth over the last year so far. Uh, and this is a, another graph that we use. Uh, Dale spoke about the 300 new members uh, each year from, from last year's AGM and also how our total membership had kind of stagnated since about 2013. Um, at the moment, we're looking pretty good. This is only a, a partial year, obviously, but we're already over 240 new members. And we've only just hired a CEO to start to push out that communications message. So now this is just new members for all members. So it's it's not just students. Uh, I'm not sure if that one includes, I don't think that includes, that's financial members, isn't it? Yeah, it includes students. It does include students, okay. Next few slides is something that's close to my heart. And that's, I think the RPGO program is underutilized. I think it's a fantastic program um, that has real relevance in the field that I'm in. So I'm actually a hydrogeologist. I'm not in exploration or, or, or project development. And these next few slides are, have come from a presentation that Doug Brown and I gave to the Australian Geoscience um, Conference in Perth in November last year. And we were talking about a mechanism to develop a pathway to professional accreditation for the hydrogeological community in Australia. Both Doug and I think the RPGO program is the way to go, but I might give a little bit of background to it. Hydrogeology in Australia has just exploded in numbers. And unlike a lot of other geoscience fields in the last 10 years, we've seen a massive influx in the number of people practicing hydrogeology. The main, reason for the, the main reasons for that is the CSG industry on the East Coast is all about groundwater. And that is, there has been a huge number of hydrogeologists who've come into the industry to there. The iron ore operations in the Pilbara are going below water table. There's an even larger cohort of hydrogeologists that are now working in that industry. Environmental and social governance, the ESG field, water has always been a hot topic. Groundwater is becoming a hotter topic. Um, groundwater and aqueous geochemistry in tailings and mine waste management since the release of the global standard on tailings management has also resulted in a huge number of new practitioners. So we've, we've seen this huge number of incoming talent or incoming hydrogeology services. But in understanding where they've come from is I think the industry has almost flipped itself on its head. When I came into the industry, the, the typical approach of a hydrogeologist was to, to enter with a geoscience degree. So I come from an exploration geology background and I have a geology degree, pure and applied. And then you specialize in hydrogeology through postgrad programs or whatever. And if, if you have an aptitude for chemistry, you might become an, an aqueous geochemist. If you have an aptitude for mathematics and physics, you might become a groundwater modeler. That was typically how the industry evolved around the business. What's happening now is we have a huge number of people coming in from those fields and practicing as hydrogeologists. So we'll have engineers coming in, we'll have chemists coming in, and it's it becomes very hard to understand what people's technical qualifications and backgrounds are. 
this is not about excluding those people from working as hydrogeologists. Rather, there's an opportunity there for us to help upskill and cross-skill those people so that they do qualify for these sorts of things. But the big issue for us is, high, is groundwater and hydrogeology is a big public concern um, because of a number of, of issues that have heard, occurred in recent years. Uh, public domain information is readily accessible and the expectations of the public have raised. So we we're pushing this concept of an RPGO program to show industry what uh, or, or present a means of actually qualifying what we do and, and how well we do it. First thing we spoke... They have a specific society themselves? They have a learned society. So they have the IAH, which is the International Association of Hydrogeologists, but it's purely a learned society. No, no, not, not in Australia. Um, Canada, the UK, um, the USA, lots of other jurisdictions they do. And that, uh, that's actually one of the key issues that, that drove this as well. Those other uh, areas around the globe, are they specific to hydrogeology? In other words, in Canada, is it the Hydrogeology Society? In, in Canada, um, if you want to practice in Canada, you have to have be a registered, you have to be a, a, a PGL, professional geologist with accreditation in hydrogeology. So they have a provincial jurisdiction that you have to be qualified for. Um, and some of the US states have the same. In the UK, you've got to be uh, registered. Um, there's a separate registration process, but there's nothing in Australia. So in Australia, there's I've actually got a slide which talks exactly to that. First thing we wanted to talk about was what is professionalism. On the right-hand side, Doug had um, surveyed all of the RPGO hydrogeologists in the AIG, and they came up with this word map. And most of these words actually fall into this description from the Australian Council of Professions. So a profession is a disciplined group of individuals who adheres to ethical standards and who hold themselves out and as are accepted by the public as possessing special knowledge and skills. A professional is a member of a profession and professionals are governed by codes of ethics and profess commitment to competence, integrity and morality, altruism and the promotion of the public good with their expert domain. So this is what the AIG is about. We have a code of ethics, we have a complaint review process, we have through the RPGO program a means of assessing somebody's qualifications and experience. This is a little bit hard to see, sorry, but this, this kind of answers the discussion we just had. This is taken, this table on the left here, sorry, Rod. Yeah. This table on the left is actually taken from a paper that Andrew Wartho authored, uh, Competency in a Global Context. It was part of the competency review for JORC. And what it is, is it's a summary of different levels of registration and qualification required for different professions. So down on this side, we've got accountants, dentists, engineers, financial advisors, legal practitioners, medical practitioners, registered nurses and teachers. This is all for Australia. And then along the top, we've got degree qualifications, post-grade qualifications, experience, uh, CPD, uh, commitment to ethical programs, basically what the RPGO program and the AIG already offer. If you look at this, all of those professions I just describe have multiple degrees of conformance required for them to actually operate. At the moment, a hydrogeologist can operate in Australia with none of them. None at all. So there's no jaw quote equivalent for hydrogeology. And we've just seen a huge increase in the number of practitioners which are working in this field. And this is why this paper has been developed. The AIG RPGO program basically ticks five of those seven boxes. And that would be a very simple and very efficient means of starting to bring some form of accreditation to the industry. Um, the problem we have is many of the hydrogeologists wouldn't qualify for membership with the AIG because they don't have that geoscience background. So we're talking with the IAH on, at the federal level at the moment, trying to push this out for the membership. And the message we've got to send is not one of, well, if you're not a geoscientist, you can't be part of our program rather, what do you have to do to actually meet the, the qualifications of the AIG membership without, without do, watering down the AIG membership? That can't change. Two other points here. Um, we pushed hard that this is a collaborative approach. It's not a replacement of the IAH 
um, as a hydrogeologist, you still need the learned society input, but the learned society doesn't provide the code of ethics and the complaints process. And the other point down here, um, international standards of competency for hydrogeology of countries like Canada, the US, the UK, among others, far exceed those of Australia. I mean, we're at zero. Um, we have some of the world's best hydrogeologists. There's no question about it. But any hope of international reciprocation requires us to lift, us our, lift our standards. We can't expect other countries to lower theirs. Um, and this, this slide here was one that got a lot of discussion. And we tried to frame it in a single image as to what we're trying to achieve. On a scale of zero to 10, at zero, you have no accreditation, no regulation or registration, no ethical or professional code compliance, no professional practice standards, no review of qualifications, and everything is about self-judgment. Whereas at the right-hand side of the scale, at 10 out of 10, you have an authorising body looking after registrations, you have entry examinations, you might have legislated professional obligations, and it is mandatory to practice. So this is kind of where lawyers live. I guess. Um, what we're talking about with the RPGO program, we think lands at about a six out of 10. It's a little bit right-hand side of the middle ground. It achieves professional accreditation um, and that accreditation requires your credentials, your academic credentials and your experience to be reviewed in the process. Um, it, it, it links you to an ethical code commitment and a complaints procedure. It's commits you to continuing professional development. And this is hugely relevant. If you look at the coal seam gas industry in Australia, 15 years ago, nobody knew about coal seam gas. Now we're probably the global experts in it. If you look at something like tailings hydrogeology, before the, the GSITM came out, it was never considered to be a, a field required for the safe operation of tailings facilities. Now it's almost mandatory. So you've got to be able to improve and maintain your knowledge bases. Um, and, and to us, this is where the, the, level, the level playing field starts at about six out of 10. If you're in the public and you're wondering whether somebody doing work is actually qualified and capable of doing so, you've at least got a chance of having some confidence there. But at this end of the scale, you just don't know. Um, and the final point really in trying to hammer this home was that getting an RPGO is not difficult. If you've got the experience and the qualifications, Membership of the AIG is simple and the application process is relatively simple. And it gives, it shows external parties that you've been geoscience qualified, that you, you're suitably experienced, you're committed to continuing professional development and you're aligned to a professional code of, of conduct or ethics. That's, um, I've noticed there's a fantastic example of that. I've worked with numerous hydrogeologists who are completely on the planet. What you're saying here is a fantastic example of how Yeah, it's really gathering momentum, but I think Lynn would agree that the, the, the flood, if I can use a water term, of applications for RPGOs, there's lots in the hydrogeology space. The other area where this is really gaining very quick prominence is in engineering geology. And the engineering geologists in Australia are in a worse place than hydrogeology because they're almost being forced into not being able to practice because they don't meet the, the, des the design and the regulatory requirements because they're not engineers and they're trying to find somewhere where they can actually maintain, maintain just basic practice. So what's the vision for this? I guess uh, the construction of a meaningful and relevant industry code, a jork for groundwater. Now, like chalk, this isn't to tell practitioners how to do hydrogeology. It's about transparency. It's about materiality. It's about competency. It's the same three uh, guiding principles that the jaw code sits, sits on. Um, we have an opportunity to frame best practice and to document technical language development. We do this in collaboration with the IAH. Um, CPD content development so that we can actually guide the information that our uh, RPGO members are learning and developing from opportunity to meet and collaborate across industries. And this, this point here, the de-linkage from industry and employer conflict of interest. It's very easy for a collective group of professionals to be criticized if they're all representing one industry or one client. But if you've got a collective group of people that are coming from academia, coming from government authorities, coming from private industry, coming from mining, 
you've got a much better chance of having a voice that that might be worthwhile using in, in a lobbying and advisory and advocacy context. Okay, I've got to get moving, sorry. I'm just about finished on my stuff. So the AIG Awards, um, huge thanks to Jeff Turner and, uh, sorry, to Mike Smith, Liam Moore and Jeff Turner to our awards committee in identifying um, uh, recipients for this year's awards. And we, of course, have the AIG Gold Medal, which recognises significant contributions to both the AIG and the Australian Geoscience community. And we have our new award, which is the Distinguished Service Award, which is provided for substantial volunteer contributions to the geoscience profession at the state or branch level. Um, delighted to announce the 2023 AIG Gold Medal recipient is Dr. Greg Corbett. Uh, Greg's a leading geoscientist in the fields of epithermal gold and silver and porphyry copper gold deposits. He first joined the AIG Council in 92 and has been on the council to about 2004. And that includes two terms as president in 2001 and 2002. Uh, Greg has a particular interest in ethics and standards and has also been involved in the organisation of several AIG and SMEDGE symposium and has also been keynote speaker and speaker at similar sorts of events. So we're delighted to announce that. And we also have our Distinguished Services Award recipients and this year we have three. Uh, we have Susie Urbaniak from Western Australia, Peter Christo from Queensland. Congratulations, Peter. And Katerina David from New South Wales. Um, I, I won't read through all of those because I know we're pressed for time, but those awards will be, the, the, the presentation of those will be arranged with the branches so that the branches can, can line up a, an event. Um, so that's the president report. I guess before I move on to item four, I just want to thank the board members, the volunteers, the the support through through um, through Lynn and Fiona and Laureline from WA and of course the CR. I think it's been a pretty challenging year for me, but uh, I think the support and the the drive that's been provided has been wonderful. Um, so item four, financial statements. Um, maybe I, this is where I hand over to you, Rod. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just very briefly, the Treasurer's report has been posted on the AIG website. Um, and I hope that uh, anybody who has any questions can uh, post them on the Q&A. And anybody who hasn't put their name in the Q&A uh, part of Zoom, uh, please do so that we can record the numbers for this meeting. Uh, in terms of financial position, uh, the AIG remains very strong. Uh, we have approximately uh, 2.3, 2.17 to 2.36 million this year, uh, a surplus of about 190,000 for the year. Uh, the surplus combination of uh, increased membership incomes, uh, conference incomes, publication sales and sponsorship. Um, but it doesn't, uh, the, the number obviously doesn't include the distribution of funds uh, from the 2021 SAEMC event, uh, which was, sorry, 22 event, which was last year and is now being issued to the co-hosts uh, uh, in 2023, but the numbers need to come out of the 2022 numbers. Um, revenue roughly doubled in 2022, uh, largely because of a couple of very successful conferences being the Structural Geology Conference in WA and the New South Wales Mines and Wines event. Um, but outgoings also increased, obviously, uh, with additional costs associated with the development of the JORC code um, and the competent person working groups um, and payments of around $67,500 have gone out to help fund that process. Um, we also have uh, a support uh, associated with that for the Jork project manager, who is now our wonderful CEO. Um, so the annual uh, AIG annual account statement has been audited by Tinworth and Company, um, and they're satisfied that it's a suitable record for the AIG financial position. Uh, the AIG board also considers that the accounts are a true and fair record of our financial position and that there are unlikely to be any financial circumstances that would have an adverse effect 
on the AIG financial position in 2023. Uh, so I just, uh, that's the statement for uh, the, uh, the financial statement. Um, also, I need to ask uh, for a uh, person to accept or otherwise that we continue to appoint Tinworth and Company as the auditor of the AIG for the financial year ending December 2023. Chris Dickinson proposes, Rob Torb is seconder. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll move back to Chris, do you want to talk about the election? Yep, thanks. So our, under our new constitution, um, we have a new board structure and this election period, all of the directors from this year resigned their position and there were nine positions up for grabs for, for the next term. Um, we had 13 members have, 13 nominations have been received and one withdrawal mid process. Um, but I'm delighted to advise that we, oh, there's 2,600 eligible members registered to vote at the time of voting and 666 members, which is about 25.5%. And I believe that's pretty much on par with the last two years in terms of the number of votes that we've received. Um, the elected candidates, so this is our new board, and it comprises Leah Moore, Catherine Gall, Dale Sims, Andrew Wolfo, Rod Carlson, Kirsty Sheeran, Mark Tate, Nick Franey, and Peter Hill. Um, so congratulations to those. And I'd just like to pass the motion if there's no objection, those members elected by eligible members being eligible be appointed as directors of the Australian Institute of Geoscientists. Rob and Mark. All in favour? Right. Thanks everyone. Um, results, so there's um, also some departing directors and some nom nominees which uh, didn't get through. So our departing directors include myself, Mark Derriman, Doug Brown, Heidi Pass, Doug Menzies, uh, Jenna McDonough and Nicole galloway Warland, and Don Smith and Damon Simons had nominated but uh, were unsuccessful this time around. Item seven is a special resolution. Um, so this was part of the member vote that went out. It is res resolved that the current code of ethics of the Australian Institute of Geoscientists as adopted in May 2020 be replaced and the proposed code of ethics be adopted. The vote for that was almost 81% for, 15% abstained and 4% against. So that special resolution is, is carried. Um, under the Corporations Act, special resolutions require 75% or higher to pass. And that is the last slide I had. Is there any other business? Um, I don't know. I have to find out that. Yeah. It'll be on the list for Zoom, but I'll um, ask maybe Peter if you can find out how many people there are online. Right. Yeah, it's too difficult. All right, we'll get back to you on that one, Rob. Um, I would like to just raise uh, a, a vote of thanks for Chris Dickinson uh, for his exemplary uh, directorship of the AIG this year. He's uh, been an absolute uh, Trojan at getting things done and has achieved uh, more this year with the board than um, in, in the last four years I've been associated with the AIG. Um, so I'd just ask everybody to uh, say thanks the appropriate way. Thanks, Thank you very much. Indeed. Okay. So that is the closure of the AGM. And uh, Jamie, if I can just introduce Jamie to the group. Jamie, of course, is our new CEO. And you're going to talk about what you've been doing. Yep. Uh, yeah, that one on the top right. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I've met a lot of people in the room before, but um, if I haven't met you, my background is geology, geophysics. Um, I've worked in oil and gas originally, then mineral exploration, and then moved on to uh, development of a geological repository for waste management. So looking at kaolin deposits and deep salt deposits within Australia. Um, I've been a member of AIG for over 10 years. 
and then most recently was working with the JORC committee um, on the JORC review process. Um, so yeah, joined in February, um, and I guess as my role has sort of, it's new, so it's set up, I just really want to thank the, oh, sorry, go back, um, the support team that I really have the pri uh, privilege of working with. So these are the people behind the scenes that regardless of who's on the board or who's in committees, these are the people that really keep the wheels moving. Um, so we've got Lynn, um, Aaron. So Lynn and Aaron are mainly the first point of contacts when someone new to the organization, you know, makes a phone call or puts an email. Uh, Fiona works with the web comms publications and IT and has been, you know, the AIG rep at many events over the last 10 years. Um, a deal works in finance. So we have an outsourced secretary and finance team. And then Laureline in WA does an amazing job helping that committee with admin events, but she's also working with me in a deal to look at, you know, the finance processes. So yeah, absolute pleasure working with these individuals and it's really nice to introduce them to people who aren't familiar, you know, with them directly. Um, so working with the board, as Chris introduced, there's a strategy which has been set over a number of years and renewed at the face-to-face -face last November. So what I'm doing is taking the governance, um, the governance framework through the different documentations, but then just aligning it into policies, processes, um, and procedures that we can use throughout all the operations. So between um, the branches, the different committees, and try and get consistency of how we do things. Um, so just a couple of improvements we've made already. Um, so membership application process, I did get a lot of feedback at different events from members who it took a while to get their membership through. So based on that, um, Lynn and I really, and the membership committee looked at how we could, you know, improve that. We've decreased, happy to say, from a four to six week turnaround for a new application. So we're getting them through between one and two weeks now. And we've done that over the last month. So hopefully that process will continue so we can just make it a, a better experience for new members coming on board. And what we've seen is delays. You always get feedback when there's a delay, but now I can happily say it's not on process. It's actually due to information not being submitted or the email to the proposer hasn't gone through. So we're working on how we can, you know, look at those and possibly explain clearer the process just to really minimize delays for new applicants. Um, communication process, working with branch committees to streamline requests for LinkedIn, website updates, mail outs. That's how all of our members hear about what AIG is doing and there's an awful lot goes on. So we wanna make sure all the different groups have access to the same support to allow that message to get out. Um, and then finance process, uh, we're reviewing all the account codes, purchase forms, the approval process and reporting. So WA has got this down really well with Laureline's help. So we're using how she's done it and we're trying to sort of streamline any be it budget reporting or finance reporting to branches and operating units um, so that everyone can get that same level that they need. Um, engagement, I've been busy since February, so I've had the pleasure of going to meet the Hobart branch. I've been to AEGC, met the Brisbane branch, Adelaide last week, a few other different events. But the aim is that I'm there for members and how do members know about events? It's through the branches. So I'm trying to work closely uh, with all of the different branches and committees to, um, to, to share information and to support them where needed. Um, New South Wales have a lot of student events going on in the next two months. So I've been attending some of those at the universities and also with the Minerals Council. Um, and on that upcoming events, there's a lot going on across the country, and there's a, a range of professional development courses as well. So that's where we are. Thanks very much indeed, Jamie. All right, we'll move on to um, our talk for the night, which is uh, going to be co-hosted this week and dropping the microphone on the floor. Thank you. I know, sorry, um, pull this uh, thing sorry. off. Sorry, Rod cut. 
Rod, Rod Carlson and Anne Ledwich will uh, present uh, the latest of the uh, information around the JORP code update. Uh, this presentation was given two or three weeks ago by Peter Stoker to the Oz IMM, um, and it's the same presentation. Um, Anne is on the JORP committee. I'm an ex officio member to the AIG on the JORP committee and have been involved uh, with the committee and with the updates and the working groups and the working group, uh, joint working group. Um, so I've got a lot of the history of what happened and Anne's going to help me present it. Thank you very much, Anne. So to start with, I'll just uh, briefly outline uh, the background for the joint committee. Uh, what it formed from was, of course, originally the Mineral Council of Australia, uh, along with the OSIMM. Uh, on the back of a, uh, a number of uh, stock market issues that were uh, brought about the mining industry's bad name and the government decided to uh, act on that. And we, the, the, the group was the, the actual committee was formed uh, on the back of that. And the AIG joined uh, at a later stage, along with other groups, including the ASX, the Financial Services Institute, and the Association of Mining and Exploration Companies. So there's a lot of uh, involvement in the committee from a lot of different bodies, and their role is obviously to generate a code that guides the reporting of mineral resources and ore reserves uh, within uh, Australia for companies that report on the ASX. Obviously, the JORT code was un instrumental in uh, forming the basis for a number of other codes uh, and uh, is, is definitely uh, recognised throughout the world as, as one of the codes that's of value. Uh, the AI, the uh, JORT committee it themselves uh, currently are uh, dominantly formed from uh, the geologists' professions. There's only one engineer and one metallurgist on the actual uh, committee, uh, a couple of lawyers and accountants, uh, and uh, Anne uh, was one of the most recent uh, appointees uh, to join. The roles are being selected from uh, a broad range of the industry to ensure that the committee has a broad, uh, a broad scope and bringing Anne in with her extensive exploration experience, um, it balanced out some of the more uh, resource estimation based experience of some of the other people. Uh, we have very few, of course, of the engineering side who, who actually look at the, the ore reserve side of things. Andrew Hall is probably the main one there, but all the way from company directors uh, through to uh, the you know, consultants and, and uh, industry people um, are invited to join the committee. The uh, ex officio members uh, are members that don't actually vote or have any influence in the meeting, but they're there to communicate the outcomes from the meetings to their membership, which is my role. So I inform the AIG board with what's been going on in the committee and, and what uh, the, the upcoming uh, requirements for the AIG might be. The code itself obviously is a reporting code. Everybody understands that it's not how you do it, it's how you report it as a public company. Um, and it, it's a, a mandatory system in, in, in the ASX, it's written into the ASX listing rules. And the reports have to be prepared in accordance with the code. Um, what we are seeing more and more is that people, uh, you know, the company, when, when the industry is growing very strongly, uh, there's sometimes statements made that are less than uh, appropriate. And the code guides what can be said, but it's really the ASX and the ASIC, the, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, who have the power to force companies to retract statements or anything like that. So the role of the code is just in how it should be reported. 
And if ASIC and all the ASX feel that it's not been reported correctly, they're the ones who will come in and say, issue a retraction, uh, et cetera. If the person who is the competent person making the statement has made that statement in error or deliberately, then it's the role of the parent bodies, the OSIMM and the AIG, to undergo that review of that uh, statement. There has to be a complaint made, and that complaint then goes through the, the, the committee that, first of all, makes a decision about whether there is a, a valid reason for it to be investigated. If there's a reason for it to be investigated, it goes up to the, the committee that looks at uh, you know, whether there should be any penalties raised against the person um, or any uh, requests for additional uh, information or to penalise the person in any way. Of course, there are cases, one very recently, where it goes to court and there was a public company director who was uh, fined $180,000 and banned from holding a directorship for two years for making false statements in a presentation to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the uh, a London um, Mines and Money meeting. So, you know, there are penalties associated with making invalid statements and it's the role of uh, the, uh, the courts to determine that, but also the professional bodies if they're uh, not a, um, a geoscientist or an engineer. That's a company director in that case. So the review process, I think I'm going to hand over to uh, Anne and uh, to, to go through uh, what uh, the review process found when uh, the DORC code was uh, looked at. Yeah, so first of all, uh, what was done when uh, was recognized that the code needed some updating was to put it out to, to the public, to stakeholders, to get their feedback. So that was a consultation process and um, through meetings and um, the uh, main one was through an online survey. And so about over 500 people responded to, to the survey. And then from that, uh, there was a series of working groups that were uh, devised. And so that wasn't the JORC committee that formed these work, that principally formed these working groups, but it, again, it was from a, a group of stakeholders. So the public, the people who are actually using, going to be using the updated code had input at that stage as well uh, in the working groups. And that was in working groups uh, dealt with specific topics. Uh, and then after that, the JORC committee itself took uh, the recommendations from the working group and drafted uh, what is now um, the draft code that is under review by ASIC and ASX. And that's a very important step before we roll it out to the public for comment, because we really need their buy-in in order to um, have, make this code work. Because uh, as you probably know, it works in conjunction with the ASX listing rules. And therefore, you know, we can't come out with something in the code that's not. Uh, Doug, 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 if you're going to ask questions, just hang on. Can we get to the end and oh, then sorry. we'll, 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 it's, sorry. <laughs> if we're going to ask a question, we have to ask a question into the microphone. <laughs> but it's online as well. So they can't hear you. That's, okay. sorry. All right, we'll, yeah. We'll be happy to answer any questions yeah, at the end because maybe we'll answer them as, as we go. So this was the review process. So as you can see at the top, uh, you know, general engagement, um, ASIC and ASX uh, have an input and online survey. Um, so there was the review of the code uh, through the direct consultation, working groups and JORC. Um, all those bits of information came together to produce this draft, uh, oops, sorry. Oops, I was trying to point to it. Um, the where we are right now is basically that top the uh, top gray box right in the middle of the slide. So that's the draft. And what we've done is we've sent it down one level to ASX and ASIC for their review and feedback. And unfortunately, that's just taking uh, a little bit longer than we had had anticipated. Uh, matters are out of our control. 
but as soon as they get us their review, um, we'll be able to, to take that one step further to uh, update the draft uh, code. And then after that, then that's when we'll take it out to the public for, for consultation. And, and in parallel with that, um, Rod touched on, um, you know, competent uh, person. And so one of the things that's, that's being looked at is um, the competent person, um, how, you know, what defines a competent person and how are we going to um, put that into the code? And really it's less of, a, of an issue for JORC and probably more of an issue for uh, the AIG and the professional bodies for the management of who actually is a competent person. But recommendations will come out of that working group. Um, so this is just a little bit about the stakeholder survey that was done. Uh, you can see that about 70% are technical people that answered. So I, as I said, there was more than 500 respondents. So 75, 70 percent of them technical. Uh, about 20 percent are from companies, directors, and and uh, executives, and then about 10 percent others responded. Um, the experience of the respondents: um, most of the people, vast majority, had over 20 years' experience with the code, um, and um, yeah. Then, so you can also see how that actually feeds into the understanding of the code. Um, the vast majority of the respondents actually said that they understood the code, that uh, transparency, materiality, and competence uh, were clear. However, transparency uh, was much more uh, understood than materiality and, and the competence. Um, the reasons for using the code, that was one of the, the survey questions. So the main one was preparing uh, competent persons reports, um, pre preparation of uh, mineral resource uh, estimates and or reserve, um, preparing expert reports, company reports, um, less so were uh, understanding uh, investment decisions and making investment decisions. Um, the people that work with the JORC code were also familiar with other codes that are used uh, in the rest of the world, the principal one being NI43101 from Canada. Um, the key areas for review that came out, um, the things that uh, the respondents wanted greater clarity on was this reasonable prospects of eventual economic extraction. And, you know, I think what we really have to, to keep in mind here is this reasonable prospects and um, also wanting clarification over the definition of a competent person and as I said that will that will be addressed um, as well and also uh, one of the biggest changes to the the draft uh, code is the inclusion of ESG that's becoming more and more important you know we hear that that term a lot these days it's it's something you know relatively new that's popped up uh, as an actual term, but I think, you know, it's, it's always been something important and now people will be expected to, to report on it. You know, when, when you say, you know, going back to reasonable prospects of, of eventual economic extraction, you know, you also have to look, you know, at the, you know, are there any environmental barriers, you know, are, are there social barriers, you know, do you have the buy-in of the communities and, and people should be reporting on that so that investors are not just looking at you know, the, the ounces or, or you know, the, the percent uh, of the commodities in the ground. You know, there are other things to be considered. And one thing I will say about this, I know that there's been some uh, questions that I've been asked lately and, and concerns brought to, uh, directly to me, and I've heard it uh, from other uh, committee members as well, is just this reasonable prospects of, uh, well, not, not just reasonable prospects of eventual uh, economic extraction, but um, guessing what is in this future code and actually people saying that they're reporting to the new code. So I really wanna stress that the code that is in effect is JORC 2012, the code that's uh, nothing has changed. It's the code that we're all used to using. So until this new one comes out, you know, I, we just work to the existing code. Um, 
Did you want to yep. take that? Thanks. Over? Um, so with the working groups that were formed as part of the review process, we broke it down into uh, nine separate areas and, and each area had a lead with support from people in industry and appropriate people who had the relevant skill set for the working group in question. So we look, uh, initially looked at what is in the current code and brought from that then, what do we think needs to be added to the existing code that will add to the value of an investor understanding more with greater clarity the risks associated with any share transactions for that particular company. That's what it's all about. It's all about the reporting of information by a company to an investor. So these were the major groups that were needed to be updated in the code. The competent person working group obviously is one that's had a very large amount of work done uh, since the working group was formed. We've had numerous meetings where we are working together with the OzIMM to come up with a, an Australian mechanism to understand how we are going to move forward with defining what a competent person should be to be able to report against the dual code. That level of competency at the moment is totally based on your self-judgment. It's, I am a competent person, I think I'm competent and I can report. But what we will be moving towards is a slightly more uh, open and transparent way of saying why you're competent and letting other people judge your competence through your words of description as to why you're competent. And this is likely to include, it's not written down, it's not enforced yet, but it's likely to be posting a, a curriculum vitae online so that people can assess your skills against that you're reporting on against your history of work. In addition, within the reports, there will be a, a succinct statement of specifically why your competence is related to the description of the report and the resource that you're or reserve that you're reporting on. So it brings a general understanding plus a specific understanding. There will be a, two different timelines. There'll be a short-term timeline where we probably can implement some of the easy wins, so to speak, in terms of setting some goals around putting CVs online, the mechanism for doing that we haven't got formed yet, that's still to come. So we've still got work to do within the next two years, we hope to develop that process. Post that, then we'll be looking at accreditation and what that might look like within Australia. So there's no definitive answers around what that will be, but that's where we're heading towards. The RPEEE, will be looked at and described at in the code, will go to public, uh, you know, and clearly there's differences in opinion between what a mineral resource estimator, an ore reserve estimator and an explorationist consider as reasonable prospects. And so there's a better definition around what it might be. The ESG aspect was the biggest group. They had the biggest section to develop because there was basically the code was almost silent on the issue. So there had to be a whole lot of understanding of words around what it should, what you should uh, uh, report on, what is material and, and how do you do it in a transparent way. Risks will be uh, discussed in more detail. Reconciliation will have better clarification in the code. It's not really defined in the code at the moment. There's only very brief mention about reconciliation. But moving forward, reconciliation will be, okay, you have a mine, you, uh, you will be required to report your reconciliation against your previous years, uh, you know, 
mineral resource and ore reserve? How did you go? Did you actually dig up what you thought you had? Being clear and transparent so that if there is a difference between what you said you had, you've dug up part of it and it's different from what you said you had, then it will be clearly reported in your reconciliation data. Doug's looking worried. I'm looking worried because he'll have some questions, I'm sure. Guidance notes, we're going to break up the code. At the moment, there are a series of notes associated with each of the points in the code. We're actually going to separate them out. They're going to be three levels of notes. Um, I'm not an expert on how it all looks. I've read it and I, I understand it, but it's like it, it gives additional information to help you report appropriately. Guidance notes, job code for non-reporting purposes, et cetera, et cetera. The other ones are relatively minor. So competence, I've probably dealt through most of these things, uh, you know, self-nomination to a more robust process, disciplinary process, enforceability and transparency, and, um, you know, potentially having peer review as a part of it. The competent person baseline study was completed. Uh, that document is available online uh, through the OSIMM, the AIG. Uh, you know, we've got through the working group recommendations, we've got through the joint task force review, and we're now sitting with that parent body recommendations for change. And, uh, you know, once we've got those parent bodies involved and got their response and adapted and where we need to, it will then go to public consultation, as Anne has said. So for ESG, whole lot of new clauses, integrated approach for disclosure, balanced reporting, and a guidance matrix, which will be a bit like a risk matrix, same sort of thing. How do you uh, uh, succinctly material, transparent information? Risks and opportunities. Excuse me, I just sneezed. Requirements for the competent person to disclose material opportunities and threats to exploration targets, mineral resources, and ore reserves. So, not only do you have to report them in a clear and transparent manner, but you also have to report. Oh, geez, my nose is tickled. Sorry. Um, reconciliation, to talked about that. You know, what are the mine parts against the mine production? Oh, dear. And dual code guidance restructuring so that it, it's in alignment with other, uh, you know, listing rules. Uh, we also will include the adoption of the Crisco template table one. So there'll be a there'll be a, a, a definite change in the way it looks and feels, but the data you present is not going to fundamentally change. There might be some additional requirements but it'll just be a little bit more clearly articulated how it will look. Because we all know that the current, uh, you know, table one is a little bit dysfunctional. You know, we, we use it, we, we have to, but it, it could be better organised. And that's the plan moving forward. Um, so these are all the people that were involved in the working groups and we thank them for all of their involvement. Uh, you know, there were a lot of very talented and skilled people in these working groups, people who really write the technical papers for uh, a, a lot of the uh, the scopes of work for, you know, papers to in presentations to uh, conferences, et cetera. So the people who were involved were the creme de la creme. They were the people who really know what they're talking about. Got which bit you're taking. Oh, that's okay. So the next steps, stakeholder engagement, ASIC review, ASX review is underway. Then when that's completed, we will pass it through Crisco, the AIG and the OSIMM and the working group members. And then there will be following edits, uh, then a, a draft will go to the public for review. So we have got through all the top row and we're up to uh, you know, that section where we've been in a bit of a holding pattern for a while. So 
there is a, uh, a project manager who is yet to be named. Um, and they, they do have an email address if you have any questions. Um, I'm sure somebody will pick it up. And um, that's about it. Uh, let's open the floor to questions. If you have a question, I will give you a microphone and I'll start with Robbie at the back and then we'll come forward. Thank you very much, Rod. Uh, is it going to be called the JORG 2023 code? Rob, that's a facetious question. Yes. Yeah, um, right. I've been at an invest, investor conference all day and, and, and there's another day tomorrow. Uh, and there's probably five papers on uh, ionic clay REEs. I defy anyone in Australia to put their hand up as a competent person in this matter. <laughs> yeah, look, and this this is where the competency issue is is absolutely relevant because you you at the moment it's that self assessment. And do I believe I'm competent? But if you are signing off on an ionic clay, and I'm absolutely with you, Doug, there, there it, like in the days when uranium first hit Australian shores, nobody in Australia was competent in signing off on uranium. Um, you know, we've had to develop a whole lot of people who are competent in lithium, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens is it's, it's not necessarily that you have five years mining and, and practical skills in that particular deposit and type of mining. But what's important is that you describe your competency in a way that says, okay, well, look, I have this, these are the reasons why I believe I'm competent. But in terms of ionic clays, there is so much we don't know. And I, I'm actually with you there on that one, Doug. Yeah. I'd like to answer that too. And just a, another general term, I think, you know, you say, okay, what makes a, competent, a person competent? And there's really no way to judge right now if the person's competent or not. So, you know, if people are posting their, their CVs, if it's out there for everybody to, to look at, to judge, it's much more transparent then. And you can say, oh, they've done that. Well, okay, that, you know, that makes them have some more relevant information, you know, competence. So I think it's just a much more, going to be much more transparent as well. Yeah, yeah but the, there's no easy answer. Doug. It's all right. <laughs> Come on. We've got no, no, uh, please. Uh, can, you lost the moment. Oh. The, the, the terminology we were using, you kept saying, sent out to the public. What mm -hmm. does that mean? What is the definition of that? Stockbrokers, the, you know, the, um, to whatever, just anybody or specifically membership? Of, of those member societies. You just said public all the time. But who does it get sent out to for comment? Well, I think by public, we mean Everybody. the public. It Everybody. can be the public. Obviously, the members of the, the societies are the ones that are going to have the most vested interest and probably be the ones that have the most valuable inputs coming back. But the public of the people buying the shares, if they want to have an opinion about the code, it's yep, anybody. It's anybody. <laughs> They'll be lodged on the the Jork website. It'll be lodged on the OzIMM website. It'll be lodged on the AIG website in areas that are public so that people can get access to it if they wish to. There's no metallurgy CPs and there's no ESG CPs. I'm comfortable signing off on metallurgy because I've been in production, signing off on ESG. How does that work? That's got part of... Sorry, when I was an expert. That didn't exist when I was an exploration geologist. Metallurgy did. Yeah, look, I mean, there is scope in the new uh, code for multiple authors and signing off uh, as competent people within both through mineral resource reports and... Uh, or reserves. So, but if with respect to metallurgists and ESG, because yes. otherwise I've got to sign off on those. Yeah. Well, that's the point: is that we will have an option yeah. to be signing off as a competent person in those areas as a specialist. So it's as a specialist. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Rod. Uh, that was excellent talk. If I did a risk assessment on Jork, I'd have to say was in the area of indicated measured resources, 
leading to a definitive and bankable feasibility. So it gets to your question. It needs the modifying factors to be addressed properly. I don't see the committee representing that fully. Only one mining engineer, no metallurgists. No, and, and, and so if I understand this rightly, we should be doing a review regularly, but this might have been triggered by ASIC and ASX because there's been a couple of projects fall over. My understanding is they've fallen over because the resources weren't calculated properly, either the grade was overestimated or what have you. I just don't see all this other stuff's great, but the risk assessment is, is that stage when we get to a bankable feasibility. And I don't see that's being addressed properly with the modifying factors at all. Okay, look, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a comment and it's fine. And I think that in general, uh, you know, the, the process of an ore reserve needs to be transparent about risk. And that is where those sorts of things should be talked about. If you're talking about does the code, does the committee adequately represent the ore reserve components of the code, I would answer and say, yes, that they do. Is there a balanced committee that includes both engineers and geologists in equal numbers, then no, it's not currently that case. But I would also say, Han and I were talking about this today, is that engineers by their nature are not people who stand up and say, hi, I'm an engineer, I'm prepared to say something. Whereas geologists most commonly, and this is not, this is a very general statement, okay, generally ge geologists are a little bit more a proactive and communicative and prepared to put their hands up and say, I'm going to volunteer and do this. Engineers, by their nature of being an engineer, generally are more introspective and less willing to put their hands up. So the committee can only work with the people that, that, that are potentially going to be involved. And, and don't forget as well, there was input from working groups as well. So it's not just you know, the, the people on the committee that have had input into the code update. Sure, sure. Um, just lost my train of thought now, sorry. Um, it'll come back to me. Uh, Engineers are trained to do risk assessments. Geologists are not. Geologists are trained to take risk. But, <laughs> but, but, as, but as, as we know, there's geologists and geologists and there's engineers and engineers. Some, some are well equipped to deal with it. So I don't, I dismiss that a little bit. Um, but with a competent person, I think five years relevance in a particular commodity, it shouldn't be that like that. It should be half and half. The other half is I think you should have experience in operations. You should have seen a mine. You should have seen reconciliation. I can't see how anyone can sign off a reserve if they haven't worked in a mine. So I'd be saying that the competent person thing ought to be opened up away from just five years of experience in a particular commodity, because I've just been through this myself with silica sands. There was no one experienced in it. I've been working in it now five years. It's been a learning progress. I can remember consulting somebody here, I think he's still here, about whether I was capable of signing off, but because I'd worked in the mine scene, I had that all round experience that I think, and I believe I've added to that situation and I sign off today as a competent person. So that's just a comment again. The other thing is with the code, you know, I'd like to see something written at the back of the code on misrepresentation, a framework sort of indicating if you F up, these are what are the likely things that could happen. And now I know you're shaking your head, but everyone backs away from it. We've, we've only had one case just recently announced, and I, I know who it is because I've been following it. It's a particular difficult project, actually. Um, but why isn't that put in there in the code? You know, because the board of directors have a responsibility. The board of directors of the OzIMM and the AIG absolutely have that responsibility. So, so, so does the public company board of directors. Well, the company board of directors, absolutely. Do we have a code for the directorship? It's managed through the ASIC and the ASX. This the, the, That is nothing to do with the JORC code. The code is how to report. It doesn't say how to do it. 
if it's not reported properly, there is a code of ethics backed in the AIG and the OSIMM that deals with people who do things inappropriately. It is not the role of the code to define what penalties should be applied. Some, some guidelines that, that if it's missed done, what, what the situation could be. You know, the well, process, that, that process, uh, yeah, I know. That's a silly insight. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but it's not the role, in my view, it's not the role of the code to define that. The VASIC may set up some problems. Yeah. And that's not being transferred. It's not being relayed to us what they are. But someone's mucked up. And, and there hasn't been any prosecutions for those guys, right? Well, it's not no comment. I mean, at the end of the day, it is what it is. I'm not saying it was right or wrong, or you know, but the question that we need to do as a as a profession is be continuously improving our profession. And so this is a continuous improvement. We are actually well behind groups like the South uh, African group in terms of their code. We're behind where Crisco is now. So we need to bring the Jork 2012 code up to the standards of Crisco as a minimum. Mark. Thanks, Ryan. And it's, it's, it's a really interesting query. And, I, and I, it's, so I have a question for the committee. Given the conversations about complaint processes, does the Jork committee believe that the discussion or generation of a simpler complaints process is in the JOC gamut or is it purely in the OSIMM and AIG gamut? I mean, in my opinion, it's it's clearly the professional bodies are the ones that have the, the power to discipline. The JOC committee does not have any power to discipline. No, no, so that's not quite the question, but the, I think a lot of people will argue that the mechanism to actually initiate complaints is really convoluted. Now, that's through the AIG and OSIMM internal processes. Um, has the JORC committee internally thought about the requirement that the JORC needs to take a greater role in how complaints are initiated and processed? I don't believe it's been considered. Is it a, a valid question? Yes. Um, I don't know the answer to it. Oh, yeah, sorry. I think that discussion probably preceded my day, so I, I can't comment on that. Um, you spoke before about having a competent person for ESG. So for exploration companies, every exploration company is going to have a, a geologist that can sign off on, on uh, uh, what you're reporting. But not every exploration company is going to have an expert in ESG. So does that mean that exploration companies are going to have to hire somebody just for that or hire a consultant every time you put out an ASX release uh, to validate that? I think at that level, you know, you have to look at this at the scale of what you're reporting on and, and how in depth you, you get to, you know, that's that's reasonable, you know, so, you know, I think that the competent person has to just look at, okay, in this project, you know, are, is there something that's going to, to stop them in their ESG process from being able to, to proceed with this. And so, yeah, think, you know, thinking about the scale, I don't think that that's reasonable to hire an expert. I think that can be assessed by, you know, a reasonable uh, review and, and of the project. The transparency of where you are in that process should be reported. But do you have to have somebody saying this is signed by committee A with the approval of the landholders and therefore they're signing away their rights to me now? No, it, it, you know, for expiration results, it will be a more, much more generic statement of we, these are the things that we are doing to encourage potential approvals in the future. So that's being transparent and material for the announcement that you're making. 
when you get to a mineral resource and you get to that reasonable prospects question, then there probably needs to be a little bit more detail. Exactly what that might look like, I don't know yet. But there will be guidance in the new code around that. Any questions online at all? Pete, have you seen any? Okay. Well, we're we're well and truly over time. It's now 7.30. Um, we were 11, but uh, they've dropped my pies. Yeah, we're, we've been talking too much. All right, well, thank you, uh, everybody. Um, we'll close the session now. Um, and thanks for your attendance.